We're going to go ahead and get started here, session number two of the book of Daniel and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to keep moving fast, but don't let that uh, keep you from asking questions, uh, because uh, as we saw in the first session, there are some, there's some valuable bits of information that I may forget to tell you um, if you don't ask questions. So I greatly appreciate your willingness to raise your hand and ask the questions that everybody else is already thinking anyway. Um, so let me pray, and then we will dive in once more. Heavenly Father, um, again, we just ask for your presence. I ask that you would guide our minds and our hearts, that this would not just be an academic exercise, but that it would increase our faith and our understanding um, and ultimately our connection with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just a reminder, um, as we go along in this seminar, um, the number on the top left hand side corresponds to the page number in the book. Uh, we're going to begin talking about the interpretation of Daniel by the scrolls. So we've talked about the biblical manuscripts a little bit of the book of Daniel that are found among the scrolls, but there were also a number of other scrolls, sectarian works written by the Essenes, interpreting um, the book of Daniel and other passages giving their view of the end times um, and of God. And we're going to look at some of those and see how they viewed and understood the book of Daniel and what that tells us about how in the larger world of the New Testament, the book of Daniel was viewed and understood during the time of Jesus. Um, let me just notice with you um, one thing about how to understand the um, designations given to the scrolls. If you turn with me over on page 19 of your notebook, this is the, a chart listing the Dead Sea Scrolls of the book of Daniel, the biblical um, book of Daniel, the copies of the biblical book of Daniel that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you'll notice the designations there. I didn't uh, tell you what these designations, how they worked uh, in the previous session. So for instance, the first scroll is 1Q Dan A, right? So the way this works is 1 stands for the cave in which the scroll was found. So 1Q is Qumran Cave 1. Uh, and these are just, that's the first cave. That's where the, um, the seven scrolls in the jars were found. Well, there were also fragments of other scrolls found. Daniel was not, 1Q uh, Dan A was not found in a jar, but it was just there on uh, the, the ground in the cave. So one, the Q stands for Qumran. So this is cave one of Qumran. Dan, of course, stands for Daniel. And A, meaning the first manuscript of Daniel that was found in cave one, okay? So one Q Dan A is um, the first manuscript of Daniel that's found in cave one. Now, it also is sometimes classified as 1Q71. This is Qumran cave one, but it's the 71st manuscript overall that was found in cave one, okay? So the A designates it's the first Daniel manuscript, but the 71 indicates that there were 70 other manuscripts found before this one in cave one. So let me just show with you one other one. So let's go down uh, maybe we'll do two. The very bottom there, second to last, 4Q Dan E, right? So this is Qumran, which cave? K4. This is the cave that we saw the picture on um, high up on the cliff, the man made cave where uh, 15,000 or more fragments were found. So K4, Dan E means A, B, C, D, E. It's the fifth manuscript of Daniel that was found in cave 4. It's also designated as 4Q116. So it's the 116th manuscript. Now that's not fragment, meaning a literary document, right? So 4Q Dan E, um, it consists of multiple fragments that they all know come from the same document. And so those numbers, 116, is not representing the fragments that have been found, but the documents. It's the 116th document found in cave four. Last one here, just very quickly, PAP 6Q Dan. 
Pap means it's written on papyrus. Most of the scrolls are written on parchment. Pap, it's one of the few scrolls that was written on papyrus. 6Q, what cave was it found in? Sixth cave. And it's also designated, of course, as the book of Daniel. There weren't any other books of Daniel found in cave six, any other documents of Daniel. So it doesn't have an A, B, C, D. It's the only one. It's also designated 6Q7. Okay, so uh, this same sort of um, system will be used to identify the scrolls as we go throughout. Okay? All right. So let's, um, let's start talking about how the Dead Sea Scrolls were interpreted by the Essene community. I mean, how the book of Daniel was interpreted in the Dead Sea Scrolls by the Essene community that lived there in Qumran and wrote the scrolls. Um, and to do this, we're going to look at two primary texts. We're going to look at uh, what is known as the War Scroll. This is a, one of the major complete documents that was found in Cave 1. There's only about seven complete manuscripts, meaning they're not fragmented. These are the ones found in the jars, including a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. But um, all the other biblical manuscripts are just, you know, they're pieces that are pieced together. Uh, the War Scroll was one of these complete manuscripts that's found in the jars. Um, it was a very important document to the community we know. Uh, they're intentionally putting in these jars the the documents that are important to them. Isaiah was a big book for them, very important. They uh, made sure to preserve that in their hurry as they fled. Uh, they also made sure to preserve the war scroll. Before we look at the war scroll and what it has to say, I want to read for you some relevant passages from the book of Daniel. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn with me there to the book of Daniel. We're going to notice some language that is here in Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 11, that is used and echoed in the war scroll. So Daniel 11, we're going to look at verse 40, all the way down through 12 verse 1. Uh, I might not read all of these verses here for the sake of time, but just a few uh, a few things here. At the time of the end. Do you guys see this? All right, so this is looking at, this is apocalyptic, right? We're not just looking at now. We're looking at the end, the time of the end, meaning the last days of earth's history. The Jewish perspective on history is not that it's cyclical. The pagans viewed history as going round and round and round like a circle. Um, they, their gods were gods of the seasons, and the seasons repeated themselves, right? So you had gods that manifested themselves through harvest, and through rain, and through winter, and summer. And so these cycles went round and round. The Jews, their god was not a god of the season or a god of weather. He was a god of history. He worked in history. He delivered his people in the Exodus. That was to them a historical event that happened. And history, they saw, was leading toward a culmination, toward an end. It had a trajectory. God was working in and through history to lead according to his purpose. You can see why some Jews would come to the conclusion like the Essenes did that everything was determined. Because God is working through history, he's ordained it, he's scripted it out, and it's following that script to this end times um, according to his will. So, the time of the end is the end of earth's history, this culmination that history is moving toward. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall enter the glorious land. Now, where do you think the glorious land is? Jerusalem. Yeah, it's Jerusalem. It's Israel, right? This is the glorious land, very clearly. So the king of the south, you have the king of the north, you have a glorious land. It's going to describe this battle, what happens. Um, I'm going to jump down to verse 43. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow his heels. But news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with a great fury to destroy and annihilate many. This is talking about the king of the north. 
He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas. Here we see this again in the glorious holy mountain. So what do you think the glorious holy mountain is? This is the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem, right? This is Mount Zion, the glory. It's the holy mountain. This is Mount Zion talking about Jerusalem. So he's going to plant his tents between the sea, that would be the Mediterranean Sea, and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. So just very quickly, if we, we talked about this a lot in the Unlocking Daniel. I encourage you to check that out on YouTube. Um, those of you there might remember discussing some of Daniel chapter 11 together. But just to give you a quick overview, we have a king of the north who is um, fighting against a king of the south. God's people are kind of caught in the middle. These are two enemies of God, both north and south. The king of the north overcomes the king of the south, but now he's fighting against the glorious land, the holy mountain, right? But he's going to come to his end and no one's going to help him. It's describing what we might even say from a Christian perspective is like a battle of Armageddon, right? A final overthrow and destruction of the enemies of God. And this is happening, remember, at the time of the end. Okay? Notice very quickly with me the very next verse, Daniel 12, verse 1. Remember in the Bible, as it was originally written, chapter divisions were not there. They were just written you know, the chapter divisions were added later to help us find passages. And here's one of those places where the chapter division can make you think that we're done with that topic and on to a next. That's not true. Daniel 12, verse 1, at that time. So what time are we talking about? The, the time of the end. This is when the king of the north is going to come to his end. There's this final battle, right? At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So this is a, I mean, this is a, a time of difficulty beyond surpassing all the other difficulties in history. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So you get the picture? Final battle, king of the north, king of the south, king of the north. He's fighting against God and his people. He's going to come to his end without help. Michael, this heavenly figure, is going to stand up. He's going to deliver God's people. There's going to be difficulty. It's going to be a time like none other, but God's people are going to be delivered. Okay? That's, that's what we see there in Daniel. The war scroll in, found among the Dead Sea Scrolls takes a lot of its language from Daniel, the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 11 and 12. Let me tell you just a little bit about the war scroll. It's called 1QM. So what cave was it found in? Cave 1. The M stands for Milhama. That's the Jewish word for war. So 1QM. Um, it is a apocalyptic work. It's looking toward a final battle in the end times where the sons of darkness fight against the sons of light. The Essenes, of course, the way that they referred to themselves was the sons of light. This is how they identify their community. Now remember, do you remember what other group they called the sons of darkness? The Pharisees, the Pharisees are the sons of darkness. So the sons of light are going to fight against the sons of light and God and his angels are going to fight against the sons of darkness and Belial, which is Satan, and the Kittim. The Kittim is a code word for the Romans. And they describe a final apocalyptic battle. The sides are drawn. Nobody's in the middle. You're on one side or the other. And it's going to end in this final Armageddon-style war. Okay? Um, let's just read together. This is from the opening lines of the War Scroll. It's quite a long document. Um, many sections here. We're going to capture just a few pieces from the War Scroll. The king of the Ketim. Now remember, Ketim is a code word. It literally means um, those from Ketim or Cyprus, those who are coming across the ocean. And it was used as a code word in ancient times to refer to the Romans. Remember, the Jews are under Roman occupation. They're the enemies, right? 
And for the Essenes, it's not just the Romans who are the enemies, but also the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other Jews, right? So these are all going to be lumped together. The king of the Katim shall enter into Egypt. Remember, we saw Egypt there in Daniel 11. And in his time he shall set out in great wrath to wage war against the kings of the north, that his fury may destroy and cut the horn of Israel. This shall be a time of salvation for the people of God, an age of dominion for all the members of his company, and of everlasting destruction for all the company of Belial. Now, we don't have time to talk about all the details of this, um, but big picture, there's a battle. Enemies of God are fighting. God's people are going to be delivered. And those who are a part of the company of Belial, that's a, a, um, another name for Satan, are going to be destroyed, right? This is the end. This isn't just a partial or, you know, a halfway victory. This is the end, uh, the final end and the final battle. I'm going to skip down here in the war scroll. Um, and by the way, I don't think, oh yeah, these, these passages here that I'm reading are not actually in your notes. Um, I, when I made the notes, I, I tried to condense things down a little bit and I decided, well, I just needed to include these passages from the War Scroll. So there are some other passages from the War Scroll that are included in your notes on page 23, but these opening lines are not included in your notes. Um, I can get you copies of these, um, of the slides afterwards if you're interested, um, or tell you about how to find these passages. Okay. So, continuing to read from the War Scroll here. On the day when the Kittim fall, there shall be battle and terrible carnage before the God of Israel, for that shall be the day appointed from ancient times for the battle of destruction of the sons of darkness. Now, you see this idea. God's appointed a day. Fate is working here. And in fact, in the War Scroll, when it talks about these armies... It doesn't use the word army when it talks about the armies of the sons of darkness and the armies of the sons of light. What it literally says in the Hebrew is the fates of the sons of darkness and the fates of the sons of light. Meaning, the people who are among those sides didn't even have a choice. God preordained who was going to be a son of darkness and who was going to be a son of light. Okay, This has all been preordained from the ancient times. History has been moving toward this point. At that time, the assembly of gods... And the hosts of men shall battle, causing great carnage on the day of calamity. Now, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Aren't these Jews writing? Why are they talking about gods, plural, with an S? What do they mean by that? So what they are talking about here, they are using gods, Elohim in the Hebrew, not to refer to Yahweh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not to refer to the Creator God, but they're using this, this God's plural to refer to angelic or heavenly beings. So this would be what we might say demons or angels. This is the assembly of the gods. This is the way that they're using this language. We know this um, not only from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but from other Jewish um, writing at the time. Okay, and notice who is fighting in the battle. You have the gods, they're going to be fighting, but also the hosts of men, meaning human beings and angelic beings are lined up in battle array together on either side. Humans and angels on one side, humans and demons on the other side, and they're going to fight it out in a cataclysmic battle of Armageddon. There's going to be carnage, we were told that, right? And the end result will be the destruction of all those who are on one side, right? All right, so you're getting the picture here? By the way, this idea is a, a bit foreign to the Jewish conception of things, but it's actually a very Greek idea. If you read, um, uh, for instance, Homer's writings, the Iliad, the Odyssey, especially the Iliad, where he describes the siege of Troy, you have gods, the Greek gods, fighting alongside human beings, the Greek heroes, in this battle. And this is almost what this is um, echoing. Very, very interesting perspective. Okay. 
Notice here, continuing on, so um, causing great carnage on the day of calamity, the sons of light shall battle with the company of darkness amid the shouts of a mighty multitude and the clamor of gods and men to make manifest the might of God. And it shall be a time of great tribulation. Have we seen this language before? A time of great tribulation for the people, which God shall redeem of all its afflictions. None shall be as this from its sudden beginning until its end in eternal redemption. This language is taken directly from Daniel chapter 11. A time of tribulation like there's never been before that ends in redemption for the people of God and destruction for the enemies of God. This is taken directly from Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12. We saw, in fact, in the beginning... Kings of the north, Egypt, and kings of the south. So the war scroll can be seen as an exposition of Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12. But there's a key distinction here. We've already noted this. In Daniel 11 and 12, who does the fighting? Who delivers? Who wins the battle? Michael and God. But there, is there any sense that God's people take part in the fighting? No. Michael's going to stand up. God's people are in a time of tribulation. They're being attacked and persecuted. But Michael delivers them. Here, for the Essenes, they're fighting alongside the angels and Michael. They've got a part in the battle. I mean, they're, and it goes on to describe, you know, they're, they're going to be arrayed in the war school. It, it tells them how to form their uh, military units, how to, um, what banners and slogans to put on their shields, how to stand in battle array, where the priests are to stand as they blow their trumpets and give the signals to the advancing armies of the sons of light. It's a battle plan for Armageddon. Very interesting. It is a detailed battle plan for the battle of Armageddon where the sons of light are fighting alongside the angels of God in defeat of Satan and the sons of darkness, meaning Jews who do not follow the Essene ways and the Kittim, the Romans who are oppressing them. Now, this is the type of view that could get you in trouble, right? You could see why they would be in such a hurry to hide these scrolls and keep the Romans from finding them. Are the Romans going to tolerate this? No, they're going to crucify every single one of them. And so they hide these um, because they do not want the Romans as they're coming through to find them. Okay, let's just read a little bit more here in the war scroll. This is um, included in your notes, page 23 and 24. Um, we're not going to read everything that's included in your notes. So starting on page 24 is the section uh, that's here on the screen. Talking about the priests of the sons of light and the sons of light, they show right on the shields of the towers. Again, this is a battle plan for Armageddon, a detailed battle plan. They show right on the shields of the towers on the first, notice the name, Michael. Michael. On the second, Gabriel. On the third, Sariel. On the fourth, Raphael. These are, um, in Jewish tradition, these are all names of angels. Michael and Gabriel shall stand on the right, and Sariel and Raphael on the left. They shall set an, amb uh, set an ambush too. And then it goes on. Let me pause here. The names Gabriel and Michael are found in only one biblical book in the Old Testament. You know which book? Daniel. When the war scroll is quoting these names, you know, Michael is described there in Daniel 11. Gabriel is the one who gives the, the message and the interpretation in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. When the war scroll is quoting these names, it's making a direct connection to the book of Daniel. And seeing what they are describing here is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. Are you with me? Okay. To the God of Israel belongs all that is and shall be. He knows all the happenings of eternity. Again, this idea of fate. This is the day appointed for him for the defeat and overthrow of the prince of the kingdom of wickedness. By the way, Daniel 11 talks repeatedly about the appointed time. 
at the appointed time the end shall be. You can see how this fit very well, this language with the Essenes view of fate and God predetermining when these things would happen. Um, and he will send eternal succor to the company of his redeemed by the might of the princely angel of the kingdom of Michael. So how's God going to deliver? Humans are fighting. Sons of light are fighting. They've got their shields and their towers and their formations. But deliverance ultimately comes through this angelic being, this heavenly being, Michael. He is the one who will deliver. And this, again, is very similar to what happens in Daniel. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Okay? With everlasting light, he will enlighten with joy the children of Israel. Peace and blessing shall be with the company of God. He will raise up the kingdom of Michael in the midst of the gods and the realm of Israel in the midst of all flesh. So God's people are saved. There's peace and blessing. He's going to raise up a new kingdom, right? Kittim are overthrown. The Roman kingdom is overthrown. Kingdoms of this world are overthrown. And now God's people will be in this new kingdom that Michael has established. Okay? Some very similar themes to the book of Daniel, right? Book of Daniel we see in chapter 2, chapter 7. The kingdoms of this world are overthrown. And there's a one eternal kingdom, one final kingdom set up by God. And God's people, if they choose to be, can be part of that eternal kingdom. They're to live for that kingdom. Their focus is to be on that kingdom. Very similar to what is here in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. But there's also some very... Interesting differences too, right? We can see that the way that the Essenes here are interpreting the prophecy of Daniel 11 in particular, as well as Daniel 12, is not primarily spiritual, not primarily spiritualistic, but militaristic, right? There's a physical battle that they need to have a plan for and by the way, this war scroll was copied m multiple times. It's not just one document. We know that this was an important document. They want their community to be ready to take up shield and sword and spear and fight alongside Michael and Gabriel and slaughter the sons of darkness and the Kittim. All right? This is their view. By the way, this language is why some uh, scholars believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls were not written by the Essenes, but by the Zealots. You might remember that the Zealots are, their goal as a Jewish faction was to physically fight and overthrow Rome. They're the ones who are going to instigate the Roman war that leads to the destruction of Jerusalem. And they see themselves, uh, possibly in an apocalyptic way, as their duty, their sole duty is to fight against physically and overthrow the Romans. There's some overlap with the zealots, but the zealot hypothesis has a lot of huge holes in it. It seems that the Essenes maybe carried a similar view to the zealots, but they were not the same people. Um, and we, we, we talked about this in the first session, why you know, the description of the Essenes fits very well with the, what we know about the sect there at Qumran. Okay, I want to just very quickly go with you to how Jesus interprets... Daniel, and some of these same prophecies that we saw interpreted by the war scroll. Okay? Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to move very quickly for the sake of time. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is giving his description of the time of the end. In fact, the chapter starts, he talks about the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. His disciples say, when's that going to happen? And by the way, when's the end time going to be? So he starts talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he starts talking about the end time. Um, although he sees these as different events, um, uh, not one and the same as his disciples imagined. Notice in Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore... When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now that abomination of desolation appears 
in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 11. And in chapter 11 is associated with the king of the north. This oppressive army that's fighting against God's people. All right? So he says, when you see this abomination of desolation standing there in the holy place. Where's the holy place? That's there in the temple in Jerusalem, right? Whoever reads, let him understand. So he's telling you, this is from Daniel, very clearly from Daniel. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And he goes on to describe, may your flight not be on the Sabbath, may you not be pregnant, you know, because um, notice what they're doing. Are they standing and fighting? They're fleeing. Very different perspective than what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jesus is not expecting his followers to fight and overthrow the kingdom of darkness. In fact, in John 19, when he's being questioned there before Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would fight. So Jesus has a very different perspective than the view uh, proposed uh, and expounded upon there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let me show you one other thing. Um, he's going to talk about for uh, verse 21, then there will be a great tribulation which has never been since the beginning of the world, even until that time. Where's that language come from? Daniel. Daniel 12, right? We saw that. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jump down with me to verse uh, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man, the Son of Man is the figure in Daniel 7 that sets up the final kingdom and overthrows the wicked kingdoms. Jesus refers to that figure here in Dan Matthew 24. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Son of Man is going to come. There's going to be judgment and salvation. It's similar to Daniel 12. But notice, God's people, they're not fighting. They're not making it happen. It is completely and utterly dependent upon Jesus' return and the bidding of His angels. They are not taking up arms themselves and fighting in this final battle. In Luke's account of this here in Matthew, Luke says all these things must be until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Meaning, you're not going to fight and overthrow the Romans. They're going to have their time. They're going to be here for a period. And sometime after that, God's going to set up his kingdom. It's a very different view than from what we find in the war scroll. All right? This is one of the ways that, especially Christianity as expressed by Jesus in the Gospels, is very different from the Essenes and the Zealots and even some of the Pharisees during the time of Jesus. All right, I've got one last place I want to go with you in understanding um, the way that the Dead Sea Scrolls interpret um, the book of Daniel. The word Messiah is found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. It literally means, does anybody remember what the word Messiah means? Angel means messenger. I heard it somewhere. Anointed. Messiah literally means anointed. Now, in other places in the Bible, when that word uh, Mashiach is used in the Hebrew, in the English it's translated as anointed. In Daniel 9, it's translated as Messiah to convey the connotation. The idea is that the Jews were awaiting an anointed one. Well, who was an anointed one? Do you remember who the Jews anointed in the ancient world? Kings and priests and sometimes prophets. But we know the main uses of anointing were kings. Kings were not inaugurated or crowned. They were anointed. Priests were not inaugurated they were, or crowned. They were anointed. During the time of Daniel, Jerusalem is destroyed. The throne of David is gone, right? 
There's no king on the throne. There's a no anointed king. The temple of Jerusalem is destroyed. There's no anointed priest working in the temple. So they are awaiting the anointed one, the Messiah, who's going to make things right. Okay? I want you to notice with me, this is from the community rule, uh, which describes the rules governing the sect there at Qumran. Notice with me, this is page 22 of your notes, the, the language here in the community rule. As for the property of the men of holiness who walk in perfection, it shall not be merged with that of the men of injustice who have not purified their life by separating themselves from iniquity and walking in the way of perfection. Now, earlier during session one, someone asked us about, oh, do escaped convicts end up there um, among the, you know, there in Qumran among the Essenes? Well, if you can see the language here, the sons of perfection are not to mingle their possessions with the sons of iniquity, meaning we're going to share everything in common, right? And we're not going to enter into that sort of covenant and community with just anyone. You have to adhere to our way of holiness, to the stringency of our community and our way of life. And so there was a period of initiation lasting years before someone would be fully accepted and initiated into the community. By the way, a ritual bath was part of that initiation ritual. Uh, that's a whole different subject, but all right. Continuing on. They shall depart from none of the counsels of the law to walk in all the stubbornness of their hearts, but shall be ruled by the primitive precepts in which the men of the community, this is talking about the community of Qumran, were first instructed until there shall come the prophet and the messiahs of Aaron and Israel. So they're saying, we're going to live this way, following these guidelines until, what's the end point, what's the finish line? The appearance of the prophet. Remember Moses said, there shall be another prophet who shall come after me. The appearance of the prophet, and then notice the word there, singular or plural? Messiahs of Aaron and Israel. Remember, who were the primary ones who were anointed? Well, prophets sometimes, but mostly kings and priests. The community at Qumran was not expecting just one Messiah. They were expecting a kingly Messiah who would sit on the throne of David, and they were expecting a priestly Messiah who would be a descendant of Aaron who would work in the temple. So they're expecting two Messiahs. Now, I should mention that the word Messiah is not as frequently used among the Dead Sea Scrolls like it is in the New Testament. The New Testament uses the word Messiah some 500 times. It's used about 32 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls, even though the Dead Sea Scrolls contain a much larger volume of writing than the entire New Testament. Um, but it's just used 32 times. But we can see some important glimpses into the way they thought of the Messiahs to come. All right. Daniel 9, Daniel is praying. He's praying about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's praying about the temple. There's this prophecy about the coming of a Messiah. And this prophecy of the anointed prince who is to come is given a time period, right? Seventy weeks are determined for your people. This language is in, picked up and interpreted by a very unique an interesting scroll called the Heavenly Prince Melchizedek. Okay, this is 11Q13, page 27 in the notes. And I want you, we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about the interpretation of Daniel found in this scroll. This scroll is what you might consider a Bible commentary. It's called a Midrash. Um, it is expounding texts of the Bible from the Old Testament, primarily <coughs> Isaiah 61, Daniel 9, and Leviticus 25. It also includes some uh, psalms in there, but it is a midrash, it's a commentary which combines these passages. Daniel 9 is being combined with Isaiah 61 and Leviticus 25. Well, what do those texts have to do 
uh, with each other in the minds of those who wrote this scroll. Okay, let's read this together. And again, we're just getting big picture here. There's a lot of complex ideas here. Don't worry about all the details, but just try to catch the big picture of what's going on. All right. And concerning that which is said in this year of Jubilee, so it's now quoting from Leviticus 25, which, which describes these periods called the years of Jubilee. And concerning that which he said in this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And likewise, and this is the manner of release, every creditor shall release that which he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and of his brother, for God's release has been proclaimed. Pause here. Just a little context of what's going on. In Leviticus 25, God describes a practice uh, for the Jews that they were to hold, where on a year of Jubilee, which was the 49th year, the Day of Atonement, on the 49th year, the trumpet was to be blown, the priest would proclaim this year of Jubilee, and do you remember what was to happen on the year of Jubilee? All debts were, debts were canceled, right? So, I mean, not just student loans, but mortgages and everything else, right? All debts are canceled. Meaning, if you have sold yourself into servanthood or slavery, you are set free. Yes, also the property, and it mentions this here in the text. The property, God's design was not for land and wealth to be accumulated through the generations by a select group, but it should be distributed evenly uh, to be passed down by the tribe. So if property had to be sold in the year of Jubilee, it would be returned to the family from which it was originally um, sold from. It, it would be returned back to the land. The land would be returned back to the tribe that it was given. So this is a big deal, right? And the priest on the Day of Atonement blows the shofar and announces, proclaims this liberty, this return, this release of debt. This scroll is now going to interpret what's going on in Leviticus 25, and it's going to apply a spiritual application to this year of Jubilee. Notice, so God's release has been proclaimed, and it will be proclaimed at the end of day. So this is apocalyptic. We're looking toward the end of the days. There's going to be a year of jubilee where debts are going to be released. Land is going to be restored. But what kind of debts are we talking about? What kind of restoration is implied? The end of the days concerning the captives, he said to proclaim liberty to the captives. This is a quote from Isaiah 61. This is going to be very important in this passage and its understanding. Um, Isaiah 61 is a passage that proclaims, says, liberty to the captives. It's this announcement. Its interpretation is that he will assign them to the sons of heaven and to the inheritance of Melchizedek. For he will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek, who will return them there and will proclaim to them liberty, forgiving them the wrongdoings of all their iniquities. A lot going on here. Let me just very quickly try to summarize. Who is Melchizedek? He's a priest. A priest and a king. Remember, he's the king of Jerusalem, who Abraham pays tithe to as a priest. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament is going to take up this figure of Melchizedek and say, Jesus... He's born of the line of David. Remember, if you are a born of the line of David, you're from the tribe of Judah. The priests were from the tribe of Levi, Levi of descendants of Aaron. So in Israel, you could not be a king and a priest. Right? 
So Jesus is born, his descendancy, his ancestry comes through the Davidic line. He's a king. Well, how can he be our high priest, our intercessor? The book of Hebrews says he's not a king according to the, a priest according to the Levite line. He's a priest according to the line of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. By the way, remember, the Essenes are looking for two messiahs, a kingly and a priestly messiah. Melchizedek is both. He is king and priest. And he is going to, it's said according to this text, he is going to, on this, this apocalyptic end time jubilee, this is the big jubilee, the big release, the big restoration, he's going to be the one who's going to proclaim freedom and restoration. But it's not freedom from debt. It's release from sin, right? Notice, he will forgive them, not their debts, but their wrongdoings of all their iniquities. So this, this end time forgiveness and grace that's announced by this kingly priest Melchizedek. Now, isn't that interesting? And we could even now start to think of some ties to someone who's a king and a priest who's going to announce forgiveness and release, can't we? Okay, let's keep going here. we got just a few minutes. we gotta, we got to go at this at light speed. Get, again, just get the big picture. Continue to read in 11Q13. And this thing will occur in the first week of the Jubilee that follows nine Jubilees. And the Day of Atonement is the end of the tenth Jubilee when all the sons of light and the men of the lot of Melchizedek will be atoned for. And a statute concerns them to provide them with their rewards. For this is the moment of the year of grace for Melchizedek. Okay, end times. Melchizedek, this kingly priest, he's going to announce salvation and forgiveness. And when he's going to do it is going to be at the end of ten jubilees. Now, how long was the jubilee? 49 years, so 10 year, uh, ten jubilees would be how many years? 490 years. Now, where did they get this idea of 490 years, an announcement of grace and restoration? Oh, we have a book of the Bible that says something about that. Let me just read a little bit more here. Oh, we already looked at this. Um, okay. Let's go to Daniel 9, 25, very quickly. If you will bear with me, we may go just four minutes over our time. But I think if we can stitch these together, you will find it worth it. Okay, Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks. How many days in a week? 70 times 7 is 490. Uh, if you have studied this before, you know that these 490 days are representative of 490 years, right? We can see this in Ezekiel, Deuteronomy, other places. In fact, as you continue reading here in Daniel 9, it becomes very clear. So this is a 490-year period. Now, what was the time period that the... Uh, Melchizedek scroll was looking forward to 490 years. Okay, that idea came from Daniel 9. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. That sounds like a spiritual jubilee, doesn't it? It's exactly what that sounds like, a spiritual jubilee. Notice... To bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint most holy. Know therefore and understand, verse 25, that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until, what's that word? Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So it's giving this larger time period, 70 weeks, 490 years are determined for your people. But then it says within that larger time period, from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the anointed one, the one that we're waiting for, shows up, there's going to be seven weeks 
in 62 weeks. Now, before the Dead Sea Scrolls came along, the way that this was phrased was a puzzle to scholars. And we had some hypotheses, but we didn't have any definitive answers. Because why would you say there's going to be seven weeks and another 62 weeks? Why wouldn't you just say there's going to be 69 weeks? Why break it out in seven and then 62? Now, seven weeks is how many days or years that it represents? Seven times seven is 49. Why is this broken out into a period of 49 and then to another period? Why not just lump it all together and say 483 until the Messiah comes? Well, that seven times seven gives us a clue, doesn't it? That this is a jubilee, right? That these 490 years are 10 jubilees. That release, restoration, forgiveness, and salvation are going to happen at the fulfillment and culmination of this time period. You guys with me? So we had a clue, but when we read the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they listed this 490-year time period as 10 jubilees, we said, oh, yes, this is how the Jews were understanding this prophecy, even in the time of Jesus, that the 490 years were, 10, were to be seen as 10 jubilee periods. Okay? Now, continue to read. 11Q13, this is the day of peace and salvation concerning which God spoke through Isaiah the prophet, who said, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who claims good news. So this messenger, remember? Melchizedek, he's announcing the jubilee, who proclaims the good news, who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. It's interpretation. The mountains are the prophets. So they're expounding this message. And the messenger is the anointed one. Remember, what does Messiah mean? Anointed, The anointed one of the Spirit, concerning whom, notice this, Daniel said, until the anointed one, a prince, Daniel 9.25. So what this is saying is, there's going to be this Melchizedek figure, this Messiah figure who's a fulfillment of the anointed one in Daniel 9.25, he's going to come and he's going to proclaim release from debts, restoration, and salvation. Now, does the New Testament have something to say about that? Does it? Absolutely! It is concerning him that is written, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion to make them understand all the ages of time, meaning this is the moment, this is the time that we have been waiting for that is going to be fulfilled. Okay, we don't have time right now to trace the timing of the history of Daniel 9 and those 490 years. It says that there's going to be a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We know that that decree happens, that allows Jerusalem to be restored and rebuilt, happens in 457. B.C., there's a command by Artaxerxes, Jerusalem um, is, is able to be rebuilt as a result. Remember, it was going to be 483 years after that until who showed up? Messiah, which leads us to 27 A.D. If you read Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3 is the time of the baptism of Jesus. And it is, stands out in all of the Gospels because in the beginning of Luke chapter 3, Luke takes these great lengths to tell us who's on the throne in Rome, who's on the throne in Jerusalem, who's re reigning over this area, uh, what time is, it's, is the reign, it's in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. He goes through all of this great detail to help us to know exactly the year that Jesus is being baptized. And by the way, it's 27 AD. Exactly fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Now, but that's not the punchline. The punchline comes in Luke chapter 4. So Luke chapter 4, 27 AD, fulfillment of the prophecy, Jesus is baptized, uh, he's anointed by the Holy Spirit, he comes on the stage as the Messiah. In Luke chapter 4, go with me there. This is going to be our conclusion to our seminar. Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes to his hometown synagogue 
Nazareth. He's starting there at home. He picks up the scroll, and the scroll happens to be turned to Isaiah chapter 61. Remember? That's the passage, one of the passages that was there in the Melchizedek scroll. Luke 4, starting in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And as he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is reading from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord, remember he's just received the Holy Spirit at his baptism. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, notice that word, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Does that language sound familiar? This is Jubilee language. To proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the year of Jubilee. But it's not just any year of Jubilee. This is the Jubilee of all Jubilees, right? This is the year when not your your physical debts are going to be forgiven, but your spiritual debts are are going to be forgiven and released. And here he's saying, God has anointed me as the Messiah to be the one to proclaim the Jubilee of all Jubilees. And the Dead Sea Scrolls says that just as the priest was the one to announce the release of debts on the Jubilee, the last Jubilee, the full final Jubilee, is going to be proclaimed by this king and priest Melchizedek, who's going to announce release from spiritual bondage. And by the way, that scroll was written before all this took place. And I believe Jesus is fully aware, and the Jews around him are aware of this understanding. And notice what he says, verse 20. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the anointed priest and king of God. I am Melchizedek, who you've been waiting for. I am proclaiming the jubilee of all jubilees. You can be set free from the debt that you could never repay, your spiritual debt to God. I'm here to give you forgiveness and salvation and restoration. It's it. It's me today, right now. It's happening. This is a huge moment. And this is how Jesus is announcing his ministry as Messiah to the world. Prophecy fulfilled. fulfilled. Daniel 9, even the understanding of Daniel 9 and Isaiah 61 and Leviticus 25 that was circulating among Judaism that time, Jesus is saying, now, this moment, this year, the anointed has showed up, long awaited, jubilee, Freedom, salvation is being proclaimed. But notice, notice the response. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words. Remember, in the Dead Sea Scroll, it was the year of Melchizedek's grace. The gracious words which he proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? How can he be Melchizedek and the Messiah and the king and the priest? We know his dad. And then they drag him out of the synagogue and they try to kill him, right? Right from the beginning. I mean, his ministry is, I mean, the wheels have just gotten off the runway because he announces from the beginning who he is and what his kingdom is all about. I'm not come for physical freedom and a physical kingdom. I'm here to save you spiritually. I am the one who can do that. I am proclaiming to you the good news, the gospel that is here and now available through me. It's a big deal. 
It's a huge deal. And it all points toward Jesus. He is the salvation. He is what everything is culminating toward. And I hope as we've gone through this, I know we went over time a little bit. I hope more than anything, your takeaway will be how amazing Jesus is. That He came and fulfilled the hopes that were there in these prophecies, but not in the way that many expected and wanted, right? Spiritually. Spiritually. All right, I want to take just a few moments. Um, I know it's over uh, time, but if anybody has any questions, uh, I just want to give you just an opportunity. And then um, if you uh, signed up uh, for lunch, Tammy is at the back. She's got the tickets. Um, and we can head over to the CAF. We can continue discussion there. But does anybody have any questions just about um, what we've covered for the Daniel and the Dead Sea Scrolls so far? I don't have a question, but I want to congratulate you. It's a great presentation. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Dead Sea Scrolls about John the Baptist. Ah, so the Dead Sea Scrolls do not contain anything specifically about John the Baptist, but there is a lot of connections between John the Baptist and the, um, the community there at Qumran. Many people believe that John may at one time have been a member of the sect of the Essenes because he, um, now he's baptizing not for ritual impurity, but for salvation and forgiveness, but his lifestyle and even the area in which he was baptizing was very close to the Qumran sect. Um, and so many people believe, uh, in fact, um, that phrase, um, I, I, I'm a messenger preparing a way in the wilderness, that is a classic phrase used by the Qumran sect to describe their mission. We are the messengers in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord. And they use this over and over again to describe their mission, which is also how John the Baptist describes his own mission. And so many scholars um, hypothesize that John may have belonged to the Essenes or been at least affiliated or associated, familiar with them in some way. Um, now, certainly he wouldn't have completely fit into their mold. Um, and uh, some of the things he says, um, you know, um, uh, would not have been uh, advocated by the Essenes. And that's a different topic, but there is definitely, seems to be some connection there. Good question. Yes? Is there any connection between these scrolls and the Apocrypha? Okay. So the question is, is there any connection between the scrolls and the Apocrypha? It's a great question. In fact, about a third of the texts found there at Qumran were what we would classify as apocryphal texts. Now, not all, and that's maybe a little broader, but these are texts that are known to the world of Judaism at the time um, of Jesus, but they're not considered canonical, especially by us today. So this is like the book of Enoch or Jubilees. Um, Enoch was there among the Dead Sea Scrolls, portions of Enoch, portions of Jubilees. Jubilees has a very interesting connection to what we um, just talked about in that Melchizedek scroll and the, the Jubilee period. Um, but yes, the Essenes wrote uh, made copies of these books. They studied them. They, you know, they, we can see ideas from these books in their other writings. So yes, there's definitely a connection there.